was in the Book of the Month Club, which is an exclusive for uh, supporters of the Evolution Institute and the T-Wall uh, 1000. Very pleased to introduce Mark Van Vucht as our speaker for today, as his featured book, and Max Bielby, who is, uh, uh, does the uh, Darwinian Business blog. Uh, Mark is in the Netherlands, and, uh, and Max is in uh, the UK, so uh, thanks to the miracle of the Internet, we're all able to meet together to discuss uh, uh, leadership from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, we have exactly one hour, and so I'm, not, I'm going to keep my introduction uh, very uh, short, more or less just pass it uh, right on to Mark, who is um, a world authority on this, uh, on this uh, topic. So Mark, without further ado. Thanks very much, uh, David, uh, for organizing this. Uh, so um, I've prepared a, um, a short presentation uh, with uh, the highlights of, um, of this book, uh, which uh, I wrote with a science journalist a couple of years ago, uh, naturally selected the evolutionary science of leadership. Um, one thing that is immediately obvious when you look at the uh, leadership literature is that there is a whole sort of troubadour style literature of leadership, uh, which uh, consists of a lot of uh, books, um, self-help books written by CEOs, successful ones, but also management gurus. And so they all have their theories and models of uh, leadership. And in fact, leadership development is a, a billion dollar industry if you look at the expenses uh, that are going on in the US and Europe annually on leadership development programs the question really is well do they work where is the evidence that they uh, effectively work and so one of the best sold uh, books is Stephen Colfi's uh, seven habits of highly effective people you may have read this uh, but again I mean these are really compelling stories but do they have any uh, scientific credibility and so I've just plotted here on the screen a graph showing um, the investment in leadership development in the US annually from 1996 to 2012 and you see a nice steep increasing line um, but at the same time uh, people's confidence in leadership seems to be dropping and so um, I mean there are different ways to look at this graph but one way uh, to interpret these data is that perhaps these leadership development programs are not very effective. Now that is where um, we came in because um, a couple of years ago we decided to look more carefully uh, at the leadership literature, the science literature, and a few things struck us immediately. One was that there was uh, a focus on the people in charge, the leaders, uh, whether they were CEOs, presidents, uh, military commanders, but there actually was not a lot of information and theory about followers. But of course, there are more followers than leaders, usually, and uh, people are following more often than they are leading, usually. So there is a gap there in the literature. Um, also, what seemed to be obvious from this scientific literature is that it assumed that leadership selection and leader emergence, that it was a sort of rational process whereby people weigh the uh, costs and benefits of different objects of leaders and then make a concerted conscious decision. Well, that probably is not the case uh, as we now know. And finally, um, there is a, a preponderance of um, a literature on leadership uh, in a modern uh, complex organizations. I mean, it started out really with uh, looking at leadership in military organizations, but these of course are all large, complex, modern organizations. and we then have to acknowledge the fact, and that's what we're doing, that a lot of leadership probably emerged much prior to the emergence of these complex hierarchical organizations. Um, and the date for that uh, is usually said that the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago. But hey, these guys here, they're hunter-gatherers of different sorts, uh, in different tribes. They all also have leaders and followers. And one could argue that this is the model of leadership in certainly ancestral times. So what does leadership look like in terms of the small-scale societies that humans evolved? That really was our challenge with this book. And so it would um, be beneficial to know a little bit more about uh, what the social structure is of these hunter-gatherer societies, their family groups consisting of clans and bands, they're nomadic, highly interdependent structures, egalitarian um, and that egalitarianism is actively protected so when you have um, would-be dominance uh, or upstarts they would be 
be effectively uh, taken down. Uh, sometimes you have hierarchies, uh, but that is only for a specific purpose, like a war or raid party or a hunting party. And authority would never really be asserted based on dominance, but it would really only be asserted based on prestige. That is the ability to help the group achieve their goals. Um, so um, we think that a lot of these um, uh, psychological mechanisms that we evolved uh, emerge from living in these small-scale societies. Um, and one of them is uh, has to do with adaptations for leadership. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. So um, I've coined this term in this book, evolutionary leadership theory, which is just a succinct way of talking about uh, the evolution of leadership. So the assumption is uh, that all group living species that they face coordination challenges and that leadership actually is a way to efficiently coordinate a group of actors. And that also means that leadership is not something uniquely human, and we'll probably get at that with the uh, Q&A uh, uh, later on. But in any group living species that has to coordinate for group movement, say, there uh, should be some sort of leader-follower structure emerging. Now, in terms of the evolutionary psychology, uh, one of the assumptions is that we have these different evolved mechanisms for leadership. So uh, they work on the basis of these conditional rules, like if I'm being threatened, I seek protection from someone who's stronger and bigger than me. Or if I'm uncertain, I follow an individual who I think knows more than me. And we think, and actually we have a lot of evidence now, that these uh, very sort of um, simple heuristics uh, can still explain a lot of leadership and followership that's going on in these modern complex organizations. Now, the, uh, the, the other question, of course, which this theory will have to uh, cope with is this huge gap that you see between uh, leadership in small-scale societies, uh, where leadership is situational, informal, and the transition then to these uh, uh, institutionalized and formalized forms of leadership. The CEOs, the presidents, the military commanders, the head of schools, etc., which have a formal role. So why did this transition occur? When did it occur? What are the consequences? That's something we have to deal with as well. All right, so I've done a lot of research with many other people on this. Uh, you can go to my website if you want to find out uh, more about some of these papers. Um, but I'll focus on um, one of the um, uh, questions, and that is how does human leadership and animal leadership, how does it compare? Now, now as I said, uh, we've done uh, various reviews of the animal behavior literature, and you see leaderships or forms of leadership emerging in different uh, kinds of species that live in groups, social species, whether they're uh, particular fish, honeybees, elephants, chimpanzees, etc. And usually you can make a distinction between two kinds of leadership emerging. One is um, lead the leader as the one who initiates an action, the initiator, um, and the other, the leader that uh, looks after the cohesion of the group. And it's almost analogous to the distinction between leading from the front uh, where you charge and uh, you expect others to follow you and leading from the back where you make sure that the people are actively uh, you, you're, you're actively pushing them towards a particular goal. Uh, now who then emerges as a leader? Um, in the animal literature it's based on motivational differences, personality differences, experience, for example a particular knowledge about where a water hole can be found but also social structure. The more central you are in the social structure of a group, the more likely you are to emerge as a leader. And one of the things we've done is a comparison between uh, humans and animal societies. So we compared eight uh, different uh, animal species uh, and, and eight different uh, human animal species or, or um, tribes. Um, and what you see is that uh, there's um, convergence between the kinds of leaders the, the, that emerge between these uh, 16 different societies, but there are also differences. And when you look at human leadership in these small-scale societies, it tends to be uh, more shared and distributed. Um, it tends to also, uh, the power differences tend to be somewhat uh, smaller than in these uh, non-human uh, societies. Um, and uh, the relative benefits for leaders are also not always that clear in these societies. That is to say that leaders don't 
disproportionately seem to benefit reproductively from taking on these leadership roles. There's obviously variation both in uh, animals, uh, non-humans, uh, as well as in humans, but that seems to be a general tendency. All right, moving on. Now this is a quote from an uh, ethnographer, which I think sums up the kind of leadership that we see in these small-scale societies. So um, you can read the quote yourself, but the owner had no hereditary or elected chiefs, but men, eh, they mostly talk in the ethnographic evidence of men, not women as leaders, but men of outstanding ability almost always became the unacknowledged leaders of their groups. Yet one man might seem a leader today and another man tomorrow according to whoever is keen to embark on some enterprise. Okay, so you see a very ephemeral, situational kind of leadership emerging where some people take, uh, take an initiative, they attract followers and then by definition they are the leaders. But that doesn't mean that they have an overall say in uh, the, the group's decision making. Uh, they can't certainly uh, exercise dominance outside their domain of expertise. Okay, so here is a table from one of our papers which gives a sort of short evolutionary history of leadership uh, consisting of these four stages, a pre-human stage, the early humans, uh, the egalitarian uh, um, um, uh, small-scale societies uh, that emerged about two and a half million years ago, to about 13,000 years ago, and then the agricultural revolution, stage three, where you have these chiefdoms, kingdoms, and warlord societies emerging, and then the last phase where we're currently probably at, and that's sort of the 250 years uh, after the industrial revolution. And you see different kinds of leadership emerging. Now, I've tried to sum that up in a figure, what I think is happening here. Um, and it's really the sort of step from dominance to decision-making hierarchies. Um, sorry, that goes too quickly. We have a dominance hierarchy, we are primates, and primates have dominance hierarchies. So from about 18 million years ago to 2 million years ago, we lived as uh, probably in, in these uh, groups that are based on dominance, where you have an alpha who uh, bosses uh, the rest of the group. Then you get a reversal of the dominance hierarchy, which is very well described in, in Chris Boom's book that I showed earlier. And then you get something like leadership emerging, where individuals take on different roles um, based on their expertise. And then after the agricultural revolution, you see that probably based on our hierarchical tendencies, we can then form these decision-making hierarchies. Sorry, that went a little bit too quickly, but that was automated. All right, now... Another core um, aspect of uh, this book is that we talk about the idea of a mismatch. So uh, the mismatch between small-scale society leadership, where our minds uh, evolved and our followership tendencies, and um, leadership in these complex and uh, large-scale societies. Now, what does that consist of, the argument? We actually have, this book is coming out next year in, uh, in the English language with um, Little Brown, where we talk about this idea. Okay, so our psychology is adapted to these uh, small-scale egalitarian uh, societies, but we live and work today in these multi-layered authority-based hierarchies, and that creates a mismatch. And one of the reasons why a lot of people around the world may be unhappy in these large, complex organizations is because they're ill-fitted with the way our minds work. And so there seems now to be a tendency towards these non-hierarchical uh, structures, uh, the startups, etc. And the question is, are they more aligned with our evolved uh, mind, and uh, or are they just a temporary phase in a, um, a, a larger move towards even more complex and, and large-scale societies? And then the question is, well, if there is a mismatch, how can we work with or around this small-scale psychology to de redesign organizations uh, that we're part of to make them work. Okay, so a couple more points and then I'll close. So here are some mismatches that we've identified in ancestral group settings. The group chooses the leader. In modern organizations, the leader is often appointed from above, eh? parachuted into an organization, which creates some issues with legitimacy, of course. In our ancestral environment, the group evaluates the leader, whereas often in modern organizations, leaders are evaluated top-down, but certainly not by the group. That's 
too sensitive or too scary or too risky um, and so forth. Uh, okay, so I have a few more minutes to round this off. Um, I can talk a little bit more about the development of leader and followership in humans, but of course it's clear to say that uh, we are natural born followers. There's no denying that and um, there are various indications of that. Uh, for example, the gaze following that occurs in very young babies where they follow the gaze of the mother uh, and then after about nine months uh, when uh, they look at what the mother is looking at and then they look back at the mother and you see some sort of coordination emerging. We have the gesturing and pointing that is going on in humans which is probably evidence for sort of pre-language uh, forms of leadership. Uh, the instructed teaching is of course something which is quite uniquely human whereby leaders not just show the right example but they also um, uh, instruct and, and tell off individuals who do it wrong. Uh, so that's what I call instructed teaching, or it's called in the literature. And then the fourth stage is the conformity to norms, which of course makes uh, leadership uh, possible at a, at a much larger scale than in these small scale societies. Um, Ash experiment, I'll forget about that, that's just an example. Um, so the assumption is that we have these evolved psychological mechanisms for following particular leaders. This is textbook evolutionary psychology for those of you who are familiar with this approach. So the idea is that uh, we respond, as you can see in the graph on, on, on the right side, we respond to certain inputs, uh, cues in our environment, uh, for example, a cue of danger or a cue of uncertainty, and then this followership mechanism gets activated. Uh, if I'm in danger, I follow a strong leader, and that then makes you endorse a strong leader. And the idea is that our mind consists of these various um, evolved psychological mechanisms, these decision rules that allow us to uh, um, follow leaders who fit particular kinds of uh, prototype and who may be uh, effective in, in, in dealing with certain uh, environmental threats. So I'll just give you an example of one of the studies that we've done where here the input is facial cues from potential leaders. So the question is who do you prefer as a leader uh, of your country when uh, some of the participants get to see the war scenario, your country is at war. Others get to see the peace scenario, your country is at peace, and then the question is, which leader you, do you prefer? Well, if you digest it, and uh, then you do as most people in our experiments do, it, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, the left face is the masculinized uh, version of a face. These are computer-generated faces. You see a preference for masculine face in the war scenario, and for more feminine faces in the peace scenario. And that seems to be cross-culturally valid. Uh, we've replicated this uh, study in, in uh, Asia, in Singapore, for example, and in Indonesia. It's been done in America, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, in the UK, uh, etc. So that seems to be responding to some sort of evolved decision rule that in times of threat, uh, external threat like war, follow an individual who's physically strong and dominant. But at times of peace, follow an individual who uh, can connect people, can uh, promote ho ho cooperation and harmony, hence a more feminine prototype. Now the question is of course, are these evolved biases or are they to some extent learned? So one of the ways you can test that is by looking at how, whether children have these same um, biases. There is some evidence that they indeed have these same biases and we're currently doing some more work on that. It also works with the presidential candidates, so you see two versions of Hillary. The left one is the more feminine one, the right one the more masculine one. Uh, you see it with Trump as well, here it's the opposite, the left is the more masculinized version, the right is the more feminized version, and when you uh, activate a sort of war prime in participants, they prefer the more left, uh, the more dominant looking Trump. Uh, and at peacetime, they prefer the more uh, feminine looking one uh, phase, the right one. Um, age preferences for leaders, we also see um, uh, when there's uh, um, uh, economic change, people have a stronger preference for a younger looking phase. Now, there seems also to be some sort of evolved uh, mechanism involved there, we think. Um, I find, I'm, I've 
finalize with noting some of the implications from this evolutionary leadership theory. One implication for organizations is that uh, if you assume that indeed we have this small scale evolved psychology, then um, one recommendation is for organizations to try and keep it as small, informal, and egalitarian as possible. Certainly at every layer of the hierarchy in an organization, you should have some sort of tribal band structure where you have near equal relationships between individuals. And those individuals should be able to interact at a personal and a face-to-face -face level because our, of course, our, our brains are geared towards these kinds of um, um, structures. Um, a plea for distributed leadership, uh, of course, we now live in a, a world where you have one president, one CEO, one director, um, uh, but probably that's asking too much of these uh, individuals and uh, what you see happening in these small-scale societies is that people take on these leadership roles based on their expertise. So you have warriors, you have peacekeepers, you have scouts, uh, and you have teachers, and they're different individuals. Mind the gap, the stronger the power difference is within a group, uh, the more likely it is that certain individuals who have uh, very clear self-interested uh, mode to, to get to the top of the organization will take over. Um, cherish your followers, the fourth suggestion. Promote stops to curtail the power of leaders. So the stops really refer to what we call the leveling mechanism. So mechanism that come out of these small scale societies in order to uh, level the power of uh, individuals. And that could be as simple as gossiping uh, and ridiculing to um, uh, the exclusion of an individual who is um, trying to boss the others. And then finally, do not judge leaders only on the shape of their jawlines, I think that probably makes um, uh, sense. So be aware of potential mismatches with ancestral environments. So given that a lot of leadership in small-scale societies was about physical challenges, group movement, defending, and certain physical features were probably uh, a good indication of uh, one's success as a leader. But is that still the case when you have a president no longer in a physical fight, but sitting at a desk uh, making decisions about life and death matters? So that's it. Thanks very much for your attention and um, looking forward to your questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was just the right length because we really do want to have a nice extended uh, Q&A period. I know that Max has questions. I certainly have a bunch. Uh, but of course, we want to hear from the uh, audience as well. So, uh, and, and Ashley has instructed people how to do that. Uh, Max, you want to begin with a question or two? I'll jump in, and then we'll see if some uh, questions from the audience accumulate. Absolutely. Uh, I'll start off with a very uh, you know, broad question first. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Mark. That was a really fascinating presentation. Um, you know, I think what immediately jumps out at me is you know how evolutionary leadership theory reconciles, you know, a vast range of leadership theories existing. Um, as, as you're a pioneer in, in this field, why do you think it took so long uh, for, you know, for this actually, this accumulation of knowledge uh, to be approached from an evolutionary perspective? You know, arguably you're the pioneer in this field and no one has done this before. Um, why do you think that's the case, that it hasn't, hasn't been looked prior? Well, I, I think, I mean, there's a, a couple of reasons. Uh, w w one is, of course, the, the sort of silo structure of university departments, uh, whereby um, people who are studying leadership, uh, social scientists, uh, are not really talking to the um, biological scientists further down the road or further down the corridor. So I think it is true to say that with uh, leadership, but also with some other fields, that these fields have uh, evolved really quite independently uh, from another and uh, it's I think only maybe 10-20 years ago probably with the advent of the internet and the accessibility of all these uh, articles from different fields that people started to see hey um, we as social scientists have been studying leadership but hey there's also people who study leadership in, in baboons or in, in, in uh, horses or in elephants or whatever so I think that's one reason, and the other reason is probably that um, the leadership as a topic has become really uh, very uh, popular um, as a result of both um, uh, the, the First and Second World War 
And so a lot of the leadership research uh, initially was really look at these military organizations, which are by definition hierarchical and also large scale to a certain extent. And, and that then has been taken over in the 50s and 60s by the business schools who looked at really only leadership in these um, corporate organizations, which also tend to be large scale, complex, hierarchical, and they were not really interested um, in um, looking at other forms of leadership, for example, in these small scale societies. And I think anthropologists were also not really interested in, in communicating with them about this. So this fill, fills a gap, I, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and it, you mentioned you know, the advent of the internet. Um, do you think progress is being made? Um, you know, with, uh, do you see more researchers looking into this field and, and publishing on the topic of leadership from an evolutionary perspective? Well, most definitely, yes. Uh, so um, I, I certainly think uh, that, uh, and, and I, I'm really sort of tr trying to do uh, uh, my part in this. So there, the flagship journal in the field is called the Leadership Quarterly. Um, and the new editorial uh, team of that journal actually consists of a um, uh, couple of people who have uh, their roots in evolutionary psychology uh, or anthropology uh, for that matter. So there is a recognition from that field, a uh, journal which is read mostly by people in, in, in business schools and in sort of social sciences department and, and practitioners, that uh, they have to take this, uh, this seriously. And of course, there's also another movement that's the neuroscience a bit, eh? the sort of uh, savvy uh, technologies uh, which allow us to um, look a little bit deeper into the, um, the the minds of the the leaders and the followers. So there's also interesting research coming out of it. But that, that again, um, as a warning signal, that shouldn't develop uh, very independently from the other fields, um, uh, and it should really. Uh, very carefully listen to what evolutionary scientists have to say about leadership. Absolutely. I mean, one more question from me is, um, you know, one of the most fascinating aspects of the book I find is, you know, the um, promotion of an evolutionary mismatch, right? So this idea that uh, not only are our preference in leaders mismatched uh, in modern society, but also how we organize people. And how you said, you know, specifically in this presentation, um, that people are ill-fitted to modern organizations. Um, you mentioned people, you know, seeking non-hierarchical structures, so startups, for example. I mean, I suppose cooperatives are another example, right? Um, but, for yes. large, but for large corporations, you know, you know far beyond Dun, uh, Dunbar's number of 150, but, you know, when you're looking at organizations in the, the hundreds of thousands, um, is there a way for these organizations to actually capitalize this and, and make organizations feel a bit more natural, or do you think it, it, it isn't possible uh, for corporations to do so? Well, I think uh, it should be possible, and if they don't, they do it at their own risk, uh, and uh, the risk is being taken over by organizations that do uh, successfully take uh, lessons from our evolutionary past. Um, and so, um, I mean, there's experiments of organizations like Gore-Tex, eh, which we quote in the book, uh, which is an organization that uh, without, I, I suppose, knowing about evolutionary theory, uh, have it spot on. So when they expand uh, to, um, uh, because of growth and, and, and uh, because they make profits, they build a, um, a department next to the old department consisting of about 100 and 150 individuals. And so that's how they scale up the, their organizations. And so um, what, what should happen, I suppose, and I've, I think I've hinted at that, uh, is that you can, of course, create these uh, large-scale hierarchical organizations, often also international, but you have to make sure that at each level of the organization there is something like a, a hunter-gatherer band with um, a small group of individuals where there's no strong status differences or power differences and people that, that have regular informal communications with one another. Now, of course, that's quite difficult to, to organize in these large international companies because people often don't meet each other. And so what you have in those companies probably is a, a high problem with trust uh, because trust builds up from personal connections. It's 
builds up from kinship, uh, but also from reciprocity, knowing each other well, interacting frequently. And if that's lacking, then perhaps the organization is not as efficient as it should be. Right. Okay. So let me take a, um, a turn here. Thanks. Um, yeah. I want to bring out um, multi-level selection a little more forcefully. I know that uh, this really is all about multi-level selection, but uh, just, to, just to highlight it, I think, and this is also to talk about issues of scale. What's the difference between a small group and a large group? And I think that what multi-level selection tells us in groups of all sizes is that um, they're, they're vulnerable, basically, to disruption by various forms of self-serving uh, behavior. And that, that's something that could happen to groups of, uh, of any size. And so if you get a group that's basically been taken over by despots, those despots are, are leaders in a sense. Clearly, they're calling the shots, and they're, you know, other people have, uh, other members of the group have to uh, attend to them. But what they're doing is not good for others or for the group as a whole. It's only good for them. Now, um, just terminologically, um, should they still be called leaders or should they be called something else if they're just abusing everyone for their own benefit? Yes, by, so uh, I think by definition they're not called leaders uh, because leaders provide services for the group, as it were. And so uh, leaders are only leaders because they attract uh, followers. And so if leaders uh, abuse their privileges and powers, uh, then they're, they're dominant, they're not leaders uh, necessarily. And so I think a multi-level selection sort of perspective on this uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, it probably describes uh, the process whereby uh, humans move from these dominance hierarchies that are rampant in, in non-human primates to these uh, decision-making or prestige-based hierarchies where by individuals got to the top of their group because they provided a service uh, to group members because they were knowledgeable, wise, or, or physically strong and could help the group, protect the group, or uh, help them in, um, in, in, in raiding or, or moving the group to, to a new place. And so um, uh, that, that transition could probably only be made possible through uh, the importance of um, uh, competition between groups. I've no doubt about that. Yeah. So, is, uh, so is it your understanding of the non-human literature that, uh, so dominance is the word that for this, this other kind of disruptive influence. If you're not a leader, yeah. then you're a dominant individual, is that right? Yeah, that, that is, is correct. Although in the, in the, yeah, sorry. And is it your understanding for the uh, uh, non-human species, of course, there's a whole range, but that, uh, that many non-human species basically are, are structured in terms of dominance, not leadership. In other words, in other words um, uh, they, they don't necessarily work very well as social groups because they're dominated by some individuals over, over others. I think, I, I mean, the picture is mixed, uh, really. When, when you look at um, uh, primates, uh, then uh, there is this picture emerging as of dominance hierarchies. But uh, what happens in, in various species a lot is that you have a, a combination of sort of dominance and prestige-based hierarchies. So with elephants, for example, uh, you still have a bull. Uh, the bull actually protects the group uh, when there is a predator uh, approaching. Uh, but it's the matriarch who takes the lead in, it, uh, in moving the group to uh, a new place or an old place. And so there you, uh, I think the, the uh, biologists have been assuming too much that social interactions in uh, non-humans were characterized by dominance, whereas uh, now people start recognizing that sometimes individuals uh, are uh, have some uh, authority over the group because they really have uh, a, a skill or a benefit to offer the group. So, and, and then you enter the domain of leadership. So I think there's more recognition about the sort of variation in these social structures in non-humans. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's true. this is actually a way for me to introduce our next book and our next author, Peter Turchin, and his book, Culture Society, about uh, cultural evolution during the last 10,000 years, uh, which is very much this same process, so that at any point in history, no matter how large the groups, you still have this variation of groups that are relatively egalitarian uh, and therefore correspondingly work well, 
and groups that are relatively extractive uh, and therefore despotic and therefore uh, don't work uh, very well. So, uh, so that that happened. That, that's happened at all points. It's happening today, and and it happens for nations. It happens for business organizations. Uh, the same dynamic, basically, all up mm -hmm. and down the scale. But having said that, I certainly agree with you that the, there's something special about the smaller group, and that the more large societies can be organized in terms of smaller groups, cells, you might say, then yeah. uh, the better things work. Yeah. So what what is fascinating to me in that respect is, um, I mean, often a comparison is made between um, uh, sort of human groups and um, uh, social insects, uh, so sort of uh, these super organisms, etc. Um, but um, what seems to be uh, quite special about uh, humans is that we have sort of made this transition from these dominance hierarchies uh, in, in sort of uh, primate evolution to these egalitarian small groups to these decision-making hierarchies where we can now put one individual up front and say you are our leader uh, we follow you and so uh, we can I think massively scale up our societies by having this kind of structure in place and it's way more efficient uh, than uh, how I suppose a social insect colony is organized where uh, there, there is not one clear leader but it's all a sort of collective um, a sort of swarming decision-making process um, but I think because of our primate past we've actually now are in a unique unique position as I've shown to turn this pyramid around uh, from a sort of reversal of the dominance hierarchy to a decision-making hierarchy but of course it's um, always uh, even within that there is a conflict between individual interests and, and, and group interests between uh, leaders who want to um, maybe exploit their position um, and followers who do not want to be dominated but they surely want to be led well, let me see. Uh, actually, let me see if there are some um, uh, audience questions uh, before before I continue. Do we have some questions from the audience, Ashley? Yeah, um, we have one from Alan. So, um, Mark, whenever you were showing those images of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, um, Alan was wondering, could you be more specific about what facial features were significant? He couldn't see a lot of difference in the photos. Yeah, so there's there's subtle differences, but uh, interestingly, the participants in these studies uh, they pick up on these uh, subtle differences. So um, I should uh, acknowledge actually a, a different Alan, Alan Grabo, who is um, uh, my PhD student, almost uh, finished with his uh, thesis, who is um, the uh, the master on on face morphing. So he uh, really uh, uh, created those pictures. Um, could you, uh, what could you, you see? Back, uh, could you bring them back, Mark, on your presentation? Uh, could I show them again? Yeah. Let's see. Okay. So, for example, here you see the Trump morphed. So the left one is the more masculinized version. The right one, the more feminized version. And I think it's um, uh, so. So the morphing is that uh, the, the the face of Trump is is uh, stuck on a, a like a, a neutral face, and then can be morphed according to the uh, uh, properties of, um, in this case, uh, f uh, femininity, masculinity. What you see on the left face, why it is more masculine is because it is uh, a more squared face um, with uh, somewhat thinner lips, even thinner eyes, more squared, and on the right, the more feminized is a rounder face, so, um, uh, generally speaking. Um, but they're very subtle, and yet participants pick up on them. So when we ask them, who would you, which which Trump would you prefer as a leader in wartime? Uh, there is a stronger uh, preference for the left version. And when we say, uh, which Trump do you want in peacetime? There seems to be a preference for the right-hand version. And um, we picked up on a lot of these in, in various studies. That's fascinating, Mark. Um, this leads on to one of my questions I have for you on not only your research on facial cues, but the, the US election. Um, I'm aware that your face lab teams, I'm assuming Alan's a, a member of, um, actually predicted yes. that Donald Trump would win um, November 2015. You made that prediction, is that right? Um, that is right, yes. So, yeah. following on from this, maybe 
if you could tell us a bit more about what exactly led you to that prediction. Because, um, you know, bear in mind the context. I mean, that was, you know, in hindsight, it might seem obvious to so many, many people now, but, you know, back then it was largely unthinkable to such a prediction, right? So, um, yeah, if you could please yeah, so, so, a bit more about that. So th this was interesting because it came out of a contest that was organized by a, uh, the, the largest Dutch national newspaper about uh, uh, predicting uh, uh, elections. And so they pitted uh, a team of um, political scientists uh, from a university in the Netherlands um, with a team of American scientists. So, no, not American. People, uh, scientists who are uh, experts in um, American history. Um, and a team of evolutionary psychologists, uh, that was myself and Alan Gravel, and, and we had to come up with predictions about who was going to be the next president of the, uh, the US without actually knowing the outcome of the primaries, let alone the actual election results. And so we basically looked at the facial features, but in combination with um, uh, the situation, the context, uh, because most evolutionary psychology hypotheses are about interactions between certain cues of, say, the face or personality, but also certain environmental cues. And our prediction was that uh, at the moment when uh, either uh, Americans were afraid of sort of external domination by other countries like China, Russia, or they were um, um, feeling this sort of threat of minority groups within the U.S. trying to take over um, um, the, the, the policies and, and uh, the, the, the makeup of uh, the states, that that would be a situation in which somebody with the features of Trump could uh, prevail. And so it was a conditional prediction, but it turned out to be the, the right one. Not the political scientists uh, had it right, not the America experts had it right, but um, we did. Yeah. And so you know, there was a lot of recent, you know, a lot of polling done beforehand, which, um, you know, the various political events last year um, weren't, uh, well, a lot of them were probability-wise, but otherwise weren't accurate. Um, do you think that your research in evolutionary psychology can help improve uh, political polling? Um, yeah, that, that's uh, int interesting. We, I mean, we have our Dutch elections coming on in, uh, in a week's time now, and so we... Uh, what we try to do is um, uh, have um, very young children try to predict the, um, uh, uh, the winners of the Dutch election by just showing them pictures and asking them, who would you want as the captain of your boat? And so the idea being that uh, these are totally naive uh, individuals. They know nothing about politics. They haven't seen these candidates. They do not know the policies, etc. And can they predict the outcome of the election just based on facial cues. Now, we think that that is probably true to a certain extent. Um, it's based on this idea of a mismatch, of course, because uh, uh, in the small-scale societies in which humans evolved, we knew our leaders inside out. We knew not just their physique, but also their personality. Uh, we knew where they were in a social structure. We knew how they responded to uh, crisis situations. Uh, we, we knew whether they were reliable and trustworthy. So we had a whole um, richness of cues to form a sort of uh, a decision about who to follow. Uh, now we live in a relatively information poor environment. Despite all the media, I mean, it's really one image uh, that you uh, have to base your decisions on. We don't have intimate knowledge about our leaders. And so that means that I think our minds lash on to very something which we consider very superficial, maybe, like height, uh, face, etc. And they get a they get a very strong weighting, I think, in the decision making process. Now the question then is what to do about that. And uh, there is some indication from uh, political science studies that People, voters who are more informed uh, about the policies, for example, that they uh, are less influenced by these uh, superficial facial cues. So I think that's a sort of interesting uh, finding, which suggests that there may be a way to sort of switch off this um, this this heuristic. Uh, are there more, are there more um, audience questions? Yeah, yeah, we have another one. Um, so. 
Ellen is curious to know more about the female leaders within your theory. So it seems sort of paradoxical that we even have female leaders. Is there a separate line of theorizing needed to explain the existence of female leaders throughout the world? Um, a very interesting question. So, um, of course, we identify in our research a niche for uh, female or feminine leadership. Uh, that's where the emph emphasis is on uh, sort of internal conflict resolution, um, um, and but also keeping the peace. I mean, both between groups, perhaps, and within groups. Um, and thirdly, there is uh, some evidence both from the primate literature, uh, chimpanzees for example, Franz de Waal has written about this extensively, about the senior females of the troop um, 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 stepping in when uh, there is a sort of dominant struggle between uh, the, the uh, would-be alphas of the group. And, and, and why do they step in? Because uh, ultimately, from a sort of evolutionary point of view, it's a, probably in a, a in the interests of uh, women or females to make sure that there is some stability uh, and cohesion within a group. Because when the group is uh, going down uh, in terms of um, internal striving and, and conflict, then it's uh, often the, the, the females and the children that suffer. So they have a strong stake in keeping the peace and uh, I, I suppose that, that explains why these preferences shift to more feminine or female leaders when uh, alliances need to be cemented uh, within a group. Well, I would think that with coalitions often, it's the coalition that's the entity that's strong or weak, and the leader of the coalition might be, uh, as an individual, might be uh, old or female, but uh, because they stand for a coalition, then uh, that, right. would be decisive. that would be the decisive factor, not necessarily the, uh, uh, the individual. Mm. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I want to take a systemic view, uh, Mark, because it's probably always been the case, especially in modern societies, including modern businesses, that there's such complex systems that nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows what the best decision is. Uh, and, and so that calls for a procedure of, uh, of, of changing, making wise decisions, which is very much a distributed process, must be a distributed process. The idea that any individual, no matter how capable and no matter what they look like, knowing what to do in terms of changing a complex system is just not going to happen. It calls for a process. And there are some, uh, there are some companies that have figured this out. Uh, so there are some best practices out there, and I just wonder, Toyota is one of the most uh, famous ones, but you know that literature better than I do, and I wonder if you could give us some um, as you do in your book, but uh, for this for this talk, some of the examples of of uh, mm. social units, for example, a corporation that's you know really done a right. good job of, of 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 adapting to to its environment. Yeah, I think um, I mean one has to look, for example, at the the, the companies of in Silicon Valley, for example. I mean, of course, they started up as small companies and then sort of got scaled up. But um, um, uh, CEOs there, I mean, uh, in, uh, I, I, I listened to an interview with Eric Schmidt, who was, a, I think, the former CEO of Google, and he basically said, we have all these um, creative um, individuals in our teams who have the great ideas. The great ideas are not coming from me, but they're coming from uh, from the crowd, from, from the people who are the experts. Um, and the only... Um, job I see for a leader is to enforce a deadline. Basically say, all right, whatever ideas we have, what we come up with, within two weeks or a month, there has to be something. And interestingly, that's very much akin to uh, what you look at uh, when you look at decision making in these small scale societies. Because there are also individuals who have a, a little bit more influence over others, but they never, ever at the beginning try to sort of dominate the conversation so we and say oh we should go um, to the west or to the east. No, what they do very smartly is they uh, listen to everyone um, and then when there is no consensus forming they may weigh in and say alright we now have to come up and reach some sort of consensus uh, and it's only at the end that they may sort of uh, step in to, to make a contribution, but not before that. And I think um, uh, a lot of these companies actually um, 
take take these lessons uh, seriously. Yeah. So to use the wisdom of the crowds. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Ashley, any more? Yeah. So Mark, you just said that um, children even show these tendencies. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so there's one one study, um, a published study in, in uh, science in 2009 that um, uh, asked uh, children in France to look at the uh, photographs of um, a leadership contest in Switzerland in these different cantons, these different areas. And so, um, quite remarkable, these children who knew nothing about Swiss politics uh, were able to identify um, the winner of these um, local elections uh, and again uh, they were of course relying on these uh, these these facial cues so we've just replicated that uh, last week in the Netherlands with the, the Dutch elections where we have these children uh, rating these um, 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 politicians just based on the faces of them. we have two different scenarios uh, you're um, on a boat, you have to choose a captain, uh, but your boat is being attacked by pirates. Uh, this is the warfare scenario. Or um, uh, it's a difficult weather and you have to work together with your friends very well to get the boat into the harbor. Who do you choose as the uh, ship of, uh, or the, the captain of your ship now? And so uh, we had this sort of war and peace kind of scenarios. And the, again, the preferences follow what we've established before. So uh, a preference for a more masculine looking uh, political candidates when the boat was being attacked by the pirates and a, a preference for a more feminine looking politicians when uh, cooperation was more important. And these are toddlers. Eh? I mean, they're between four, is it toddlers in English? Four and, and six years old. So they seem to be responding to maybe some sort of evolved prototype. Have you carried out um, Have you carried out these same studies with the children um, cross culturally? The reason why is that um, th could these behaviors be learned? So could these be appropriated through culture? The reason why is the individual who asked this question. Um, they are in Norway, and so Norway has flat hierarchies, many women leaders, small pay gaps. And yep. so it resembles small group structures, and everything's working pretty well. Um, so yes, could this but, uh, not be innate, or rather, could it be learned? I, I think it's probably uh, it's probably both. Eh? So uh, it's an. I mean, interesting that you bring up Scandinavia because quite a few of these studies that I cite uh, have have been done actually in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, where there's. A political scientists who have expertise on these phases and interesting they pick up on the same uh, phenomenon not not with children necessarily but uh, uh, in Scandinavia people also seem to follow this decision rule uh, when in danger or under threat pick a more dominant uh, leader and I mean the idea is simple that you don't want a dominant individual of course uh, but if he can protect you and your group then you sort of uh, trade off the the um, potential benefits with with the potential risk of having a dominant individual who abuses their position and um, and so um, yeah I, I think they are sort of universal preferences um, but they are predisposition things that you can e more easily learn to associate uh, protection with uh, maybe a, a strong leader um, but that doesn't mean that you cannot um, uh, socialize individuals into um, uh, not paying attention to these cues, giving more information, um, giving examples of, for example, very successful um, uh, women leaders. Um, um, and so I think it's not either or. Uh, there are things that you can learn more easily than others, and you see that in the very young children. But I think these things can also be unlearned. Well, I'd like to elaborate on that um, and to talk about norms, uh, which are huge and all societies have norms and, and then which more or less govern agreed upon uh, behaviors. Uh, and that's both nature and nurture. Norms is both nature and nurture. The whole psychology of norms is one 
that is uh, deeply innate, and yet what, what the, the, the content of a norm is highly, highly flexible. And uh, as someone who studies Norway uh, very closely, uh, and uh, other European societies, including, including uh, 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 the Netherlands, is they differ a lot in their norms, and that the Scandinavian societies, I think also the Netherlands, has like the hunter-gatherer norms. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a scaled-up version of reverse dominance. What Chris Bohm talked about, talks about for small-scale societies, uh, leveling basically a lot of leadership control, uh, so on, has been scaled up successfully in, um, in um, uh, Scandinavian countries and I think also in the, in the Netherlands. And curiously enough, if you go back in American history, only about 50 years uh, to the New Deal and and uh, and uh, other eras in American history, you find that it fluctuates within each within each nation. That these um, uh, of these norms. So America now, and this is again due to Peter Turchin's work, um, is now at a high point of inequality, as as is uh, as is the uh, as is the U uh, the UK. It's it's not normative basically to be egalitarian, and there's a narrative which says uh, all of this is okay. It's the neoliberal narrative that more or less says it's okay for society to be this um, uh, this unequal. But then there's other nations in which that's not the case. And the norm, the national norm, is much the same as a hunter-gatherer norm. Uh, the difference is it's been implemented at a higher scale, right? Yeah, so so the, the way I look at these uh, cultural norms is, is, again, as sort of responses to certain environmental situations. Now, it's well known, for example, that the sort of egalitarianism in the Netherlands is, is probably a, um, can be attributed to the uh, sort of collective uh, uh, fight against uh, the, 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 the water, eh? the building of all these dikes, the structures that needed to be in place, uh, where everyone had to weigh in and there were no uh, fraud free riders tolerated and you couldn't uh, exclude yourself from uh, joining in the cooperative ex activity because you were a lord or a mayor or whatever no you had to take full uh, social responsibility so it's due to these ecological conditions uh, that these um, uh, um, um, norms are shaped and then uh, the question is how are they then perpetuated within uh, society and for example, I think that there's probably a clear norm differences between societies and cultures where there is a, a scarcity of resources which can only be achieved by collective action uh, versus um, a country where there's an abundance of resources, resources and you can basically uh, fight for yourself uh, and so and uh, the, the individualism, so-called individualism in America uh, compared to the collectivism in Western Europe may be due to these sort of ecological, different ecological conditions. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, we have only two more minutes. Uh, Ashley, is there a final question from the audience? No, that's, we've gotten everybody. Okay, well, uh, so uh, let me take this opportunity first to thank uh, you, Mark and Max, for, uh, for uh, being present, and then to uh, announce that the next Book of the Month Club is going to be Ultra Society by uh, Peter Turchin, who is the Vice President of the uh, um, Evolution uh, Institute. And this will be on, on uh, basically how uh, we became the greatest cooperators on Earth Thanks largely, not entirely, but very largely due to warfare. So there's the uh, there's the uh, odd combination that uh, we cooperate to compete, and our uh, our capacity to cooperate is based very much on a on a long, long history of a, of, a, of a violent intergroup uh, uh, competition. Does not need to be that way in the future, but it certainly was that way in the uh, in the past. So, uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, any any final words from you? Well, I've spoken enough, I think, <laughs> but it was a great, great um, uh, experience for me. But Max, do you want to? Uh... Well, I, I could ask you several questions, Mark. But um, likewise, it's uh, you know, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to to be a panelist. So thank, thanks, you know, all of you and Ashley and Est and. I, I do have one one point uh, that. Um, we are going to come out with a, um, uh, I think, a, a series on um, the question what um, an evolutionary perspective can um, 
contribute to um, business and business education. Um, right. So right. I think very interesting for both scientists and practitioners who are interested to see how um, evolutionary thinking can actually inform business practice. Um, and so that'll be um, hopefully coming out soon. So. Yeah, this like, and I think that this collaboration between the three of us is something that very much got started thanks to the t Ball 1000, and I hope that other collaborations like this will start up. I see tremendous potential in the Evolution Institute and this self-supporting group of people that we're forming that we call the t Ball um, 1000. is uh, this is for me an excellent adventure. So thanks you all for for supporting um, our efforts, and uh, please help us uh, recruit others. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay,